Good evening. Good to see all of you here tonight for this special service. Uh, before our invocation, I, I want to give just a, a couple of words of uh, sort of instruction, I suppose. Uh, when we, tonight we'll be taking communion and we'll be taking it by intention. Uh, what that means is uh, when the time comes, there will be four, um, four of our deacons here at the front, two on this side, two on this side. One, uh, two will have plates of bread, two will be holding the cup. You simply take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and then eat and find your way back uh, to your seat. We'll be doing that that way. And then at the uh, end of our service, when we light the people's candle, Nikki and I will light our candles uh, from the center Christ candle and then make our way down the aisle, lighting the candle of the person on the end, and you just pass that light down the aisle when that time comes. So just a few words uh, of instruction there. I'm sure we'll all sort of get our, our wires crossed as it goes, but that's all right. We'll figure it out. But as we come together tonight for this special time of worship, let's begin with a word of prayer. Great God, we are here in this place tonight, gathered together to celebrate the coming of a Savior, the coming of a child, the birth of God into the world. God, may our hearts be full of anticipation as we await your arrival. God, may we be full of peace, hope, love, and joy as we enter in, Lord, now to this time of worship, a time when we celebrate, a time when we rejoice, a time when we reflect, and a time when we listen, when we listen for your voice calling us ever on into the work of your kingdom. Be with us now, Lord Jesus, we pray in your holy name. Amen. Our first hymn for the evening is hymn number 145, Oh Come, All Ye Faithful. You know this one. Let's stand as we sing this wonderful hymn of the faith. be seated. Would you turn to your hymnals to responsive reading number 635? That's number 635. It's in the way back.
Christ's incarnation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was light, and the light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He came for testimony, to bear witness to the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of a man, but of God. Thank you. You can remain seated as we sing hymn 128. In 128, one of my favorites, it came upon a midnight clear. Sing it, would you? It came upon the midnight clear, that glory. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Curius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out to the city of Nazareth and to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to deliver. And she brought forth her first son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Now there were some in the country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring good tidings and joy, which will be for all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill to men so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another let us now go into Bethlehem and see the things that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at the things that the shepherds had told them. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told to them. The first Noel in 136. Let's stand as we sing this great carol. that last verse together. Thank you. 
became flesh and lived among us. Matthew's gospel employs language from the prophet Isaiah to speak of the same truth. Matthew says, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. We will most likely say that this is the season to celebrate the birth of the Christ child, the birth of a Savior, and that is true. But the deeper meaning to those words, I think, is captured in Matthew's use of Isaiah and most poetically in the prologue to John's gospel that we all said together in response. You see, when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, we are celebrating what's called the Incarnation. The arrival of God, God's self, in the flesh and blood and bone of a baby. When we gaze into the cradle at Christmas, we are viewing the creator of the universe, vulnerable and helpless, small and fragile. When we proclaim the birth of Christ, we are proclaiming the arrival as God, of God as one born in the most unexpected circumstances to the least likely to wield power and in the most obscure of places. Of course, the incarnation of God in Christ isn't about the birth of a super baby who's going to grow up to be a superman, nor is it the story of a child born to be some sort of demigod with Herculean strength and human mortality. The incarnation of God in Christ is a deep mystery with which we may be too reluctant to wrestle. For after all, if God has been born as a helpless baby, who needed to be burped after he was fed, changed several times a day, put down for a nap or two, then who's steering the universe? If God is a child being cared for by a mother and father, who's making the sun come up? Who's making sure time ticks onward? Who's answering all those prayers about rain, about money, about someone's favorite team winning the game? If God comes to us as a child, as an adolescent, as a teenager, as a man, walking the very ground we walk, what does that really mean for our understanding of God? After all, if God has come to us, what are we supposed to do with him? To get at where I'm going, I, I want to share with you a few words from, from one of my patron saints, Clarence Jordan. This is what Clarence said one time about the birth of Jesus and the incarnation of God. He said, what the virgin birth is trying to say to us is not that a man became divine, but that God Almighty took the initiative and established permanent residence on this earth. Now we today have reversed the incarnation. Instead of the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, we turn it around and we take a bit of flesh and deify it. We have deified Jesus and thus effectively rid ourselves of him even more than if we had crucified him. When God becomes a man, we just don't know what to do with him. If he'll just stay God like a God ought to be, we can deal with him. We can sing songs to him if he'll just stay God. We can build cathedrals to him. This is the bind we get in today. We reverse the action from heaven to earth and we turn it around and build it from earth to heaven. And salvation becomes something that we will attain someday rather than God coming to earth to be among us. So we build churches. We set up great monuments to God and we reject him as a human being. And then Clarence tells this story about a church in Georgia. He said they just set up a big $25,000 granite fountain on its lawn. That was a lot of money back in the 50s. There's a lot of money now. There's a whole lot of money back then. He said it circulated water to the tune of a thousand gallons a minute, which ought to be enough to satisfy any Baptist. But what on earth, Clarence asked, is a church doing taking God Almighty's money in a time of great need like this and setting up a little old fountain on its lawn to bubble water around? I was thirsty, and you built me a fountain. We can handle God as long as he stays God, Clarence says. We can build him a fountain. But when he becomes a man, we have to give him a cup of water. And so, Clarence said, the virgin birth is simply the great transcendent truth that God Almighty has come into the affairs of man and dwells among us. 
Tonight we come to gather around the Lord's table to eat bread, to drink from a cup that reminds us of the ultimate reality of God's incarnation. That God has endured the pain and cruelty of crucifixion. That Christ, in the words of the Apostle Paul, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. <clears throat> Tonight, we are reminded that we serve a God who has refused to simply stay God, but has come to be among us, to share in our pains and our joys, to dwell among us in the midst of all that life throws at us, Tonight, on the eve of Christ's birth, we celebrate the arrival of God and the great mystery of God's love and eternal presence among us. So may we be encouraged in knowing that God is indeed with us. May we be strengthened in believing that God is not cloistered in the out-of-reach corners of a heaven beyond the skies. May we rejoice in knowing that the love of God that became real all those centuries ago in a stable in Bethlehem, is still here. Still lives among us and is forever calling us deeper into itself. Deeper into that love that compels us to welcome the stranger, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to visit the prisoner, to heal the sick, to strive for justice and righteousness for all people. May we celebrate God's coming to us. Though we may not fully comprehend all of what that means. And may we rejoice in the truth. That the word became flesh. And lived among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory as of a father's only son. Full of grace and truth. Amen. On this Christmas Eve, we join with all Christians all over the world as we gather to celebrate the birth of the one who is the light of the world. Over the last few weeks, we have lit four candles. The first was the candle of hope, 
reminding us of the promises God made through the prophets of a coming Savior. Hope is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at the light of this candle, we celebrate the hope we have in Jesus Christ. The second was the candle of peace, reminding all Christians that it is only by walking with God that true peace can be found. Peace is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the peace we find in Jesus. The third candle is the candle of love to remind us that Jesus is God's gift of love to us and that in him, the light of love triumphs over any darkness in our lives. Love is like a candle shining in a dark place. As we look at the light of this candle, we celebrate the love we have in Christ. The fourth candle of joy reminds us of the message of the angels who proclaim the joyful good news of Christ's birth. Joy is like a candle shining in a dark place. As we look at the light of this candle, we celebrate the love we have in Christ. The final candle is the Christ candle. It is placed at the center of the wreath to remind us that Christ is the center of our lives. We light the Christ candle to remind us that the light of the world was born this night. People who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Christ is the light, is the light and shining in a dark place. As we look at the light of this wreath, we are celebrating the birth of that light, Jesus Christ, into this world in each of our hearts. Amen. You join me as we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, the one whose birth we celebrate this night, we are reminded that just as you were born into this world, that you also died. And as you were born in flesh and blood, that your flesh was broken for us and your blood shed for us. We are reminded as we gather around your table and as we are served tonight, we pray your blessings on the bread, blessings on this cup. And as we take it, where we are reminded of your great, powerful, and eternal love for us, love that shines through the darkness, love that brings with it hope, peace, and joy, a love that you give to each of us so that we may give it to everyone else. Holy God, be with us in this time when we share this meal together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Ask if our four deacons would to come forward.
you all staying.